Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, my guests are Larry Bass, CEO of Ireland's cross-genre production company, Shinna Will, and editor and content director of Real Screen, Barry Walsh. KSM Media's Gertz Lesis reflects on a year of hybrids, and career coach and wellbeing expert Tracy Forsyth talks us through how to channel your inner champion. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. Before we start this week's show, I wanted to let you know about Telecast Plus, our brand new newsletter containing my take on the stories of the week, interesting charts, rumours, execs for hire, and all sorts of other interesting TV industry stuff from around the web you may have missed this week, compiled by me. It's totally free. Just sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And it'll drop into your email inbox every Friday. You'll also find that link in the episode description. Sign up now and we'll see you in your inbox every Friday. So on this week's show, I'm joined by Larry Bass and Barry Walsh. Larry Bass is founder and CEO of Shinawil, one of Ireland's leading producers of both scripted and non-scripted content. Shinawil both creates formats and also adapts some of the world's biggest TV brands for Irish audiences, including The Apprentice, Dragon's Den, MasterChef Island, The Voice of Ireland, and most recently, Dancing with the Stars Island. And Barry Walsh is editor and content director for Real Screen, and has served as editor of the publication since 2009. As content director, he also oversees the development of content for the brand's market-leading events, the Real Screen Summit and Real Screen West, as well as new content initiatives. Welcome to the show, Larry Bass and Barry Walsh. Hi, Justin. Hey, Justin. Thank you very much for joining us this week, guys. Larry, starting with you. So how are things in Dublin? Are you currently in lockdown over there? The whole country was in lockdown until December the 1st, um, but we're on a five-stage government uh, protocol in relation to COVID. So level one, two, three, four, five. We were all in in level five. It's now level three which means that on uh, Friday this week, uh, the pubs that serve food can open, which is very important in Ireland. Yes. I mean, it's like in the UK, in certain tier levels, you can go to the pub, but only to have a, in inverted commas, a substantial meal. But I, I don't know. Is, that the, is, that, yeah. is that the same in Dublin? Yeah, no, correct. All over the country. And it's not only in a country that's sort of social life nearly revolves around the pub. Unfortunately, a lot of the, especially the the country pubs in Ireland are suffering because they're, you know, just where people meet and greet and talk and gather. And that's the tradition and norm here. It's only really in the city pubs where they cater to a sort of a, a maybe a, a lunchtime trade and they have restaurants and they have food menus that are the pubs that can actually open. Obviously, restaurants, everything's been closed, but now restaurants and pubs that have a what they call a proper kitchen because in the previous relaxing of the lockdown, some pubs were trying to get around the, the rules and, and allowing you order in a pizza or other such like uh, things. But basically, it's, it sounds similar to the UK, substantial meal, and you can only uh, be in situ for 90 minutes. So it's, it's tight. I've been to Dublin, had some great nights in the bars there, as I'm sure many people have. And uh, I have to say, surely a pint of Guinness does count as a substantial meal in its own right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think in this time it does. But, you know, the good news is that maybe in the new year we'll enter a world of vaccines and even production may start getting back to a norm. I think it's been incredibly difficult for everyone in production. We've had to struggle on, unlike uh, the UK. I think um, a previous telecast I listened into, one of the heroes talked about was John McVeigh and the ability for PACT to lobby government to bring in a substantial industry-wide COVID insurance plan. Unfortunately, we don't have that here. We do have a very basic cover for scripted uh, shows that are funded through the Irish public sector. So Screen Ireland funded programming or RTE funded programming has a very limited COVID cover, but uh, general production, unfortunately not. So the COVID protocols that the Screen Producers Ireland introduced with the production community here um, are in play both at live action, scripted and 
factual program making. So it's meant that the the sets are unusual or unusually quiet in that you minimize the amount of people around the camera. Then the actual camera departments and crews have to be very disciplined in following those protocols, you know, masks all day, checking in with, uh, you know, the whole crew beforehand in terms of health and welfare, temperature checks every morning. And it's, you know, it is working. All the big international shows are back in production. Apple are shooting Foundation and Troy Studios and Limerick. Netflix are here doing shows and there are a number of big movies being shot here. So whilst it's difficult, it's not impossible. And now, Larry, you're renowned as being one of the leading unscripted and entertainment TV producers in uh, in Ireland, but you also launched a scripted division recently. Has that helped you being a business that has got such a range of different genres that you work, that you work in? I think it's certainly, you know, looking to expand any business, you've got to look at ways to grow the basic business and open up other new markets. And certainly with Ireland focusing a lot of the benefits of shooting in Ireland on the scripted world, it made sense for us to move into scripted. And thankfully we did, and we launched our first show earlier this year, Miss Scarlet and the Duke for Element 8 and A&E Networks in the US. And that show went really well, and we have a bunch of other shows in development and hope to close finance on a new original crime thriller uh, with RTE for early next year. I can't go into details just yet, but it's at the final stage of financing. And I think COVID has helped their scripted division really zone in and and double down on development. It's one of the areas that uh, Screen Ireland uh, helped the industry by opening up new funds for company uh, slate development. So we've used that slate development finance to really beef up our slate and be ready for taking new products to market when the markets open up. Um, on the unscripted side, unfortunately, we lost our biggest cash cow. We do the Irish version of Strictly or Dance with the Stars, as it would be in the US or uh, around the world. And unfortunately, that show fell victim to the risks around COVID. It was felt that the the risk from an RTE point of view is just too too great of a risk to take. We wouldn't have the resources of bigger networks like ABC or BBC where they can put in place heightened pro COVID backstops in terms of extra filming time and all sorts of other protocols to alleviate any risk. We just did not have that luxury. So unfortunately, no show, which would normally be in the height of pre-production now, that's gone away. But we have moved that production team to work with our non-scripted development team. And the result of that is a show that goes into production next week for RTE, a new format we've created called Soundtrack to My Life, which is actually a beautiful show where major musical artists will come in and talk about their life through songs that influence their world. So they'll talk us through their songbook um, and those said same songs will then be performed by the RTE Concert Orchestra. It'll be in their Christmas schedule, not on Christmas Day, but around around about the New Year period. Fantastic. Touching on scripted again. Now, I believe that you're one of the only TV executives I've spoken to this year who's actually attended a real-life market. Could you tell yeah. us a bit about that? Yeah, quite bizarre. Uh, We were, you know, we would uh, submit projects from time to time into various um, pitch competitions, you know, Series Mania, Berlin, and uh, Mia in Rome. And this year we were selected to pitch a show called Kill, a show written by Barry Devlin, one of Ireland's premier uh, writers. And Barry and I actually took the decision that if we were selected to pitch uh, at a market and the market was having pitches uh, physically, it would be bad manners not to be there. For the first time, I was on an airplane in 2020. Uh, The last time I was on an airplane was Content London just before Christmas last year. It was bizarre going to an empty airport to arrive in, in Rome where it wasn't so empty. And it was probably before a week or two before Italy went into a full lockdown again. And whilst the market was very conscious of social distancing and and making sure that you had to wear masks, in fact, unlike Dublin, you actually had to wear a mask anywhere you were in public, whether you're just walking down the street or a bus or a train or taxi, 
even uh, inside the hotel, I forgot my mask uh, one morning, went down for breakfast and was swiftly told to go back and get my mask. I think that level of mask wearing certainly helped to uh, allow the market go ahead. There wasn't as many people as would have normally been at uh, Mia, but I have to say that the physical pitch went ahead. I'd Maybe 80% of the people pit, due to pitch on the scripted drama side were there. A huge amount of the documentary side were there. And like all of these markets, it's only by being there you realize the opportunity in talking to other like-minded producers. And we're now in discussions with an Italian company on documentary that they actually pitched, which we believe we can help add value to. So it was great for a change to once again meet executives from networks and also talk to other producers and be able to go out and have a bowl of pasta and a glass of wine together um, help the sanity but i didn't really enjoy the two weeks i had to self-quarantine when i came home for after of course that's a it's a big price to pay but i think many of us probably would pay that price if we would uh, got the opportunity of a uh, a real life market barry welcome to the show any snow there in toronto yet <laughs> as as it happens, Justin, today is the first day of real tangible snow, and uh, my my kids were super excited. They dove out into the front yard and uh, without boots and uh, had at it. So uh, yeah, we've got it, Barry. Obviously, uh, real screen must have been a uh, an interesting year. The last time we saw each other was at the summit in New Orleans, which was, I think, you know, for many people, the last real life industry event that we'd attended. Looking back at the year, uh, reflecting on the year in the unscripted industry, many people were predicting a golden age with drama production shutting down across the summer and, you know, new challenges coming in in terms of various other protocols, some of which that Larry mentioned earlier on. Is that what you've seen? Has there been much evidence of this uh, golden age of unscripted across the year? I'm always reluctant to use the term golden age because gold tarnishes in time. But I think it's definitely increasingly healthier. You know, as everybody knows, there are new platforms emerging practically weekly. And so that means more buyers. Uh, it, it does seem like over the last couple of years, Netflix has really found its footing in terms of unscripted and broadened its offering. So there were genres that perhaps they weren't in before within unscripted that they've really made quite an impact on, you know, dating, lifestyle, et cetera. Amazon is increasingly playing in the field in different territories. HBO Max, when they launched, they were very aggressive when it came to unscripted in terms of commissioning and acquisition. And many of the com big commissions out of the gate for HBO Max were unscripted. With Molly Thompson on board heading up docs at Apple, you know, they seem to be reawakening after what seemed like a, a dormant period in terms of unscripted documentary. I mean, in terms of cable and broadcast, things are ticking along. There are definitely challenges on the cable side, which we will probably get into a little bit later. But, you know, certainly global formats are enjoying a bit of a boom and are, are in vogue with what's happening with the pandemic. With this uh, pesky pandemic impacting uh, scripted production, as you say, there's been a wide increase in demand across the board. So fact and unscripted archive led content, it's all seeing an uptick. So it's probably a, a I'm not going to say it's a better time to be an unscripted producer than a scripted producer, but I would say the force is with you if you, <laughs> if you are in the unscripted side. I mean, there's still challenges as, as Larry pointed out with, um, with their version of Strictly, you know, producing uh, shiny floor shows, producing natural history, producing travel programming, all of these things have logistical um, issues that really need ingenuity and innovation and a little bit of luck to, uh, <laughs> to, to get over. But, you know, certainly producers, if anybody, the production community is adept at finding those solutions. And we've seen, obviously, the rise of AVOD, really. I mean, AVOD's mm -hmm. been around for a little while now, but presumably a number of production businesses and distributors have been reaping the benefits of this new emerging way of consumers enjoying programming without having to pay cable fees and any other fees. I mean, there's whole channels dedicated to show brands, essentially, now. 
So I guess if you're a producer with a good, healthy catalog or a distributor, of course, as well, then that's something that's really being helping out as well. We'll see what happens with HBO Max. And they were saying that the, there's going to be a potential AVOD offering in 2021. They're on track for that. It's definitely exploding. I think uh, YouTube kind of coming back into that area is certainly helping. And uh, there seems to be healthy commissioning happening on that front as well. We'll see, uh, as of this taping, the big reveal for the Discovery uh, streaming service has yet to happen. That's going to be happening tomorrow. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that, but we'll see if there's you know, any sort of AVOD uh, plans in that area as well. We've discussed a little bit the Discovery uh, streaming service on the show a couple of times before, and you know, there's maybe a bit of a sense for some people that it's it's quite late and it's going up against these you know big established players. But let's see, maybe the Avod is the way in uh, for them. And uh, I've seen in the UK that that they've done a, a deal with Sky, where uh, Sky Q subscribers can get a free year's subscription to the discovery uh, platform so that's going to be interesting so obviously th- this time of year anybody in the unscripted business really starts to turn their head towards january and the real scream summit now we've seen lots of different virtual events in the tv industry calendar come and go this year uh, some more su- successful than others having seen those what learnings are you taking into next year's summit as you say there's been a lot in this area because everybody's kind of had to pivot to this and um as you say i I think some have been more successful than others a huge part of the real screen summit is the networking aspect and kind of what larry was saying about being at, at mia you know the the ability to meet people and have that kind of serendipitous lucky meeting where all of a sudden you find you have shared interests and you have some uh, projects that could could work together. At our company at Bruneco, we really made sure that we were able to kind of create a streamlined platform that would help facilitate this as closely as possible to the real thing. And short of having a Star Trek transporter room, I think we're getting there. The event is basically going to be filtered through a, a revamped version of our real exchange platform. And uh, we're calling it a purpose-built immersive business tool. And it's really designed to facilitate connection, schedule and manage your meetings and your pitches and host all the content and networking. So rather than have things kind of fragmented, everybody's going to be able to access it through there. And uh, I, I think the other thing, and maybe some of the other events would agree with this, one of the advantages of doing things virtually is you can probably land some people that you might not have been able to get um, in terms of speakers with travel and schedules and putting people on planes and, and et cetera, et cetera. We've been lucky in that regard as well. We have Ken Burns and Lynn Novak, Lynn Novak as uh, keynote speakers who will be talking about the wealth of the huge documentary uh, projects in their catalog and things on the way. Um, we have Rob Share now, of course, at A&E Networks, who is going to be doing a keynote. And this might be a bit of a scoop for you, Justin. I don't know. We, we have Suzanne Daniels, who has a global original content at YouTube, who's going to be doing a keynote presentation as well. Right. And we're still more things to be announced. So, uh. <laughs> All right. That sounds great. I mean, I have to I admit, I'm, I'm missing going back to New Orleans. I've really enjoyed my trips there. I think I'm right in saying that Real Screen Summit 2022 will be in Austin, Texas. Is that right? I guess we won't be going back to New Orleans now. As far as I know, <laughs> the plan is still ahead for Austin. So uh, certainly looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, definitely I agree. Uh, it would have been wonderful to be in New Orleans. That was such a magical location in a magical town and i have every indication that austin is going to be similar i've not been but uh i've always wanted to go especially with the south by southwest being there and um the huge uh, music and food culture so it's gonna be a lot of fun no i'm looking forward to that that's gonna be fantastic so now it's time in the show for story of the week where my guests get to highlight the tv industry news stories that's caught their eye in the last seven days Larry, what's your story of the week? I thought it would be a shame, Justin, to talk to somebody from Ireland without bringing you an Irish story of the week. 
Well, I would expect nothing less from you, Larry. (laughs) And this week, I have to say, uh, one of the stories which has probably brightened up a lot of people's lives is a show which has been the longest running chat show in the world, my understanding is, the Late Late Show. It's an institution here in Ireland, uh, a weekly chat show. It's only ever had three presenters in its long career. And the current presenter, Ryan Tuberty, presented this year's annual toy show. And that's a show that the whole country sort of gets ready for and kids around the country love to see uh, toys uh, played out. And it's, it's it's just a unique type of show. You have to see it to understand it. But last Friday, obviously, the country was in lockdown and the Late Late Show has continued all the way through lockdown without audiences and a lot of people virtually coming onto the show. But they managed to put together a spectacular kids show live pre-records and everything else and they managed to get an audience of 1.6 million people in a country of a population of 4.9 that's an 80 percent audience share so who said broadcast telly is dead Um, and it's not a telethon it's literally a show it's an entertainment show where they highlight toys and the, the unique thing about the toy show is they allow the kids road test all the toys and it's incredibly entertaining but they really reached out and and had some fantastic kids on the show uh one young guy adam stole the nation's heart he's a young guy who's you know he can walk but he spends a lot of his life in a wheelchair his big dream was to work in mission control for nasa but obviously he can't be an astronaut because he suffers from brittle bones and your heart will go out to this little guy. And he was fantastic in the show. And post the show, the word got out somehow to NASA. And they've invited and said, look, when, when he grows up and he's ready, they're ready for him. Oh, fantastic, fantastic story. Um, yeah. And they also ra- launched a, a sort of a fundraise for children's hospitals in Ireland, hoping to raise maybe a half a million euro. And at last count, they've raised over six and a half million euro, which would be something like 95 million quid in the uk show of that size and scale so it's it's a great story the whole country uh, enjoyed it the ratings obviously that's a target now for us all to try and reach yeah we'll put a, a link to that story and and hopefully some uh, some online clips uh, to the show as well in the episode description of the podcast barry what's your story of the week well we kind of uh, tipped our hat to it a little bit earlier and uh Funnily enough, it hasn't actually happened yet. It's happening tomorrow. So we're gazing into the future. But I would say it's going to be the reveal of the Discovery streaming service. Direct consumer has been on their radar for years. David Zaslav has been talking about it for years. But now, as you're saying, they're moving into the game when it's getting increasingly crowded. You know, not everyone is succeeding in this. You know, we saw Quibi, what happened there. There is a very real question of how many services people will support and how many, uh, how long they will have the service before they, you know, move on to something else. And certainly when it comes to factual streaming services, I mean, we have Curiosity Stream, which was uh, created by uh, Discovery's founder, John Hendricks, original founder. And uh, we have newer platforms like Waterbear, which uh, is headed up by Ellen Windemuth. And of course, Netflix, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Amazon, Apple, um, YouTube. They're all in the game and they're all broadening their their offerings in terms of moving into you know, blue chip, um, lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. But I think once the scripts acquisition happened for discovery that kind of brought their offering into a whole new level so now they're bringing a considerable amount of lifestyle content in the mix in addition to the science and exploration content that the discovery brand is known for and with the co-viewing potential of svod and avod i think it kind of gives us service an edge i mean we were talking about brands and franchises you could probably take the 90 Day Fiance franchise and and give that its own streaming service. Um, you'd certainly have enough content for it, but the audience for it would probably be quite substantial as well. And the, the other thing too, I mean, from a production perspective, you're going to have content specifically designed and exclusive to this platform. We know that they've been hiring programming executives across genres, lifestyle, factual documentary specifically for the service so it'll be interesting to see what's going to be coming kind of exclusively to the platform and how they're going to take existing franchises and uh, treat those with potential extensions 
I think tomorrow will be interesting. Yeah. If the news has been announced by the time we actually publish the show, then we'll we'll also include some links. But I'm I'm guessing the news is going to be right across the world. So uh, so probably people will, will discover it anyway. Interesting. So now it's time of the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to tell to get in the bin. Larry, who's your hero of the week? For me, the everyday heroes in our industry are the frontline production uh, staff, especially the freelance crews who have got to get out. They've had to adopt their um, process to shoot in a safe way, protecting subjects of shooting, each other. And it's made uh, that getting back into production for all of us so critical. Uh, and we depend so much on these frontline production teams. There's a lot of credit being given to the frontline health staff and I think they do fantastic work in every country but I think frontline TV crews actually are up against it as well and are working in a difficult environment to do what is their normal difficult job on long hours and long days you add in the COVID protocols uh, for me every single one of them are heroes and Larry who or what are you telling to get in the bin we're at that time of year where um, probably like most people living in Ireland and the UK, we're sick and tired of listening to news um, being dominated by talk of Brexit. It was interrupted slightly by COVID, so we had the C word for so long. Brexit is uh, on us. And, uh, you know, at the end of the, the 2020, we move into post-Brexit world um, and we all just have to get on with it. And living on an island like Ireland where we're going to share the only land border that's between Europe and the UK. It's going to be an interesting time, but I'm certainly delighted to put Brexit in the bin in terms of a saying. But we're looking forward to post-Brexit world because we set up a joint venture with ZigZag from London to give us that sort of protection against Brexit. We set up a new company called Shindigs in Northern Ireland, bringing Danny Fenton's team and his factual prowess to match with our prowess of significant shiny floor entertainment shows, we're going to hopefully be the bastion of new fact and uh, shows coming out of Northern Ireland to a network near you soon. So we've been busily working away at developing a new slate together. So for us, you know, a post Brexit world hopefully will be a very positive, exciting new world. But I'm delighted to possibly see the back end of uh, any talk about it i think that goes for most people and that's the kind of anglo-irish agreement that we want to hear about isn't it you know companies getting together and co-producing and and adapting to the new rules that are going to be upon us although as a brit i still have to admit i don't really know what it's going to mean for me i think we've all been busy with with other things so barry who's your hero of the week well, I, I guess I'll take a, a little bit of a page from, from Larry's book and uh, also kind of salute frontline workers, more so, uh, I think, on the essential services side. I mean, as Larry said, we have a lot of recognition of those on the front line in the medical world and and rightly so but uh, you know there's certainly there are people working in grocery stores there are those who you know do not have the luxury of working from home but are deemed to be uh workers in essential services and they're really kind of keeping the wheels on the bus so to speak so uh hats off to them but in, in terms of the industry i i really like to salute the media companies that are actually putting money where their corporate mouths are and uh establishing real policies meant to foster true diversity and inclusion on and off the screen. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen BBC Studios just announcing uh, an inclusion rider policy for productions. Uh, ITV is putting forward its Step Up 60 initiative. Viacom CBS is taking a, a no diversity, no commission initiative internationally. All these are pointing in the right direction. And it's it's a long overdue move, but at last it's happening. We've seen 2020 has been a, a you know a year of real change in that aspect, and hopefully 21 is uh, is going to be similarly so. And Barry, who or what's going in your bin? <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's a lot to bin this year, <laughs> but uh, I I don't know. I would say if you spent any appreciable time on social media, I think you'd agree that this year has really kind of amped up the aggression and. Uh, I think it's really been the year of virtual vitriol. So I would probably bin the aspects of those technologies that encourage us to be 
our worst selves. I mean, perhaps it's anonymity, the, the lure of anonymity or the lack of quote unquote moderation. But I mean, I can't help but think that we're doing real damage to ourselves as a species in ways that will probably become more and more apparent in the near future as we continue to lash out at each other virtually. And I can, I can only hope that we're going to have a kinder and gentler world come 2021. That's a great note to uh, to end on here, here. Larry and Barry, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Really enjoyed chatting to you both. Larry in Dublin and Barry over there in Toronto. Hope you guys stay very well. And I guess we'll be seeing you online at the Real Screen Summit. Yes, yes. Come on. Come on. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, Justin. Cheers. And once again, it's time to catch up with our resident well-being expert and career coach, Tracy Forsyth. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to the show again. Thank you, Justin. I'm happy to be here. Uh, what are we talking about this week? This week, I really want to talk about why I think losing your job or being out of work doesn't mean losing your value and your worth. And it's something that I had to find out the hard way. And I'm not going to lie and say it's an instant lesson, but it's something that I think everybody should be aware of because we're going through really, really tough times at the moment in the content industry. And I know that there's going to be a lot of very, very self-critical overachievers out there who are feeling really, really rotten about themselves. And I want to I want to make sure that they are not blaming themselves or feeling that it is down to them. Well, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, it's a it's an emotional thing, and you 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 do tend to tie lots of your own identity into the into role into the job that you have. So when you are made redundant, and I think you know everybody can potentially expect to be made redundant sometime in their career. It's not the end of the world, and actually, it can be something really really valuable to set you on a a new path to new experiences and new opportunities it often is going to feel painful. And in a way, it's like a process that you have to go through and accept that, you know what, I'm going to feel rubbish for a while, you know, before something picks up, because that is the type of person that I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to be useful. And I want to be able to be an arena where I can demonstrate my skills. And if that's taken away from you, it's very, very hard to feel happy. There's just a couple of just big points is that when I first got into coaching, you know, I learned the difference between being internally validated and externally validated. So that was all kind of like gobbledygook to me uh, in the old days. But what I really realized is that so many of us in the in the content industry and beyond, to be honest, are externally validated. We have all our self-esteem and self-worth wrapped up in our job title and our salary. And because in the in the content industry industry it can be a fast moving industry where if you're freelance you go from one job to the next job to the next job, etc. You tend to focus kind of your sense of achievement on what job you got and how well you did, what the feedback is. And the danger there is that you're not in control all the time of somebody giving you a job or or what somebody thinks of you. And so if, if those things are taken away or not given, then you're there sort of high and dry. So today, I just really wanted to talk about just kind of like raise the point about self-worth and that even if you don't have a job, whether that's through redundancy or scarcity at the moment, it doesn't mean that you are without the, the huge amount of value that you have. So I, I'm just going to relate it to my own experience because I've been there and done that. So when I was a freelance TV exec, I got this most amazing job. It was the maternity cover, a maternity cover for a commissioning editor role at the BBC. And I loved it. You know, I loved the work. I loved the fancy title. I felt super important. You know, I was a commissioning editor now, you know, in charge of lots of different programs. And obviously, like anybody doing maternity cover for a dream job, you hope the new mum would decide not to come back. So I could keep the role permanently, but she did. And after nine months of being in that job, I found myself out of work. And, you know, I wanted to be a commissioning editor again. And you can imagine how competitive that is. Previously, as a freelancer, because I'd always been freelance, you know, I had hustled and bounced from one role to the other, only taking breaks if I knew that the next role was lined up. Somehow it had all sort of worked out, you know. But this was the first time that I was out of work for what would be 
three months. Now, I know that doesn't seem a long time now that we're in a global pandemic, but back then there was no pandemic. So for me, it felt like a very, very long time. And during that time, I was absolutely miserable. You know, I just felt worthless because I couldn't get a job. And I felt that with no job title that I didn't even exist. When I look back, I think it was, you know, a really unhappy time in my life. And what's worse is that at the time, you know, I had so much going for me. I had two young kids. I had a loving husband, still do, I hope. Uh, You know, I had a roof over my head. I had parents who care about me. I had my health and lots and lots of friends. But somehow that didn't matter. You know, I just felt wretched. I felt worthless. And I I realize now that, you know, my self-esteem and my self-worth were entirely wrapped up in my work. My happiness and fulfillment were linked to something I couldn't control, which was somebody else giving me a job. And what's more, you know, by then I had something like 15 years experience in the industry working on amazing series all over the world. But I felt that it didn't count. You know, if I wasn't working, I was just useless. And, I, you know, I can't lie. That feeling continued until I got my next role. But, you know, several years on and, you know, I'm a freelancer now. I have a portfolio career, so I have my own business. But again, you know, sort of facing uncertainty over the future. But this time I really don't feel miserable and wretched. I've learned that my value and my self-worth go beyond my job title and income that somebody else can decide to give to me or not. So in these extraordinary times, if you are doubting yourself and your value, then here are some things to consider. So, you know, hashtag be kind has been very much on the agenda over the last year. And so it should be. But that also includes being kind to yourself. Hashtag be kind to yourself. Practice being kind, compassionate and encouraging to yourself as if you were somebody else. You know, most people would not treat other people the way they treat themselves. So just imagine, you know, you are a different person. So instead of beating yourself up and knocking yourself down so hard and blaming yourself, pretend that you're somebody else and see how you talk to yourself then. So if you knock yourself down, the harder you knock yourself down, the harder it will be to get back up again. So really just practice kindness, compassion and encouraging to yourself. Yeah. And that will increase your mental resilience. And remember that you work in a very competitive industry. That's really good in one way because it means we've got lots of exciting people to work with. But the fact that you've worked in this industry at all means that you are already talented, hardworking and driven. Just because everything is on pause does not mean that you are not still all of those things. You are talented and you have huge value even when you are unemployed. You know, at the moment, this time, it's really not you. It's the situation. My next point is really to recognize, and this is something that I could not do back then, recognize that you have value beyond your job title as a family member, a friend, a community volunteer, a pet owner. You know, you are treasured by many people who don't have any clue for what you do for a living. I mean, let's face it, whose parent really understands what they do for a living in TV? Not not many So I want you to really count all the ways that you bring joy, pleasure and use to the world outside of your job. You are not just your career. It is just one part of you. My next point is really don't suppress your negative feelings. Let them up and out. It is a painful process. So don't try and there's don't try and squish that down honor those feelings by listening to them and taking them seriously there is no right or wrong in feelings they just are so whatever the emotion anger fear anxiety acknowledge that no matter how uncomfortable that is how you currently are you know show yourself some compassion and care process those feelings you know, don't repress them. I think we're all just so used to trying to put on a brave face. Well, you know what? It, it, I, I don't think squishing down those feelings helps at all. And finally, try where possible to reframe the situation you're in from a different perspective. In the same way that an object can look very different from a different angle, so can your thoughts on an issue. So if your current perspective is, this is the end of the world, then try looking at it from a silver lining or unexpected benefits perspective. If you were absolutely forced to say something positive, what would it be? 
We are all creative and resourceful, especially in this industry. So make sure you put those qualities to good use when it comes to yourself. All very wise words there, Tracy. And actually, you know, if you think about it, we're coming into the depths of winter. It's all dark nights. There's lots of people, unfortunately, losing their roles. But we know just around the corner, there's going to be vaccines, spring's coming. And like we've said on a a previous show, I think, you know, it's going to be like a champagne bottle being shaken up. You know, the whole of the content industry is going to explode with creativity and opportunity and work. So that's only around the corner. Exactly. That's something for all us all to, to look forward to. Yeah. Tracy, thanks so much for coming on the show again. Fantastic to, to have you on. Really wise words. And we hope to speak to you again next week. See you next week, Justin. So it's that time in the show to welcome Gertz Leases from K7 Media onto Telecast again. Hi, Gertz. How are you? Hi, very well. Um, We've finally made December. It, it feels like we're we're starting to maybe wind down to the end of the year to get this goddamn year out of our system and maybe look ahead to interesting things in 2021. It's been an extraordinary year in with its highs and lows, both, I think. That is true. That is true. It depends on what side of the fence you're on, I suppose. I mean, if you're a, a multinational streaming company, then you've had a pretty good year. But maybe if you're a a drama producer, maybe not so good. Well, you're very right, yeah, exactly. So uh, what are we going to be talking about this week, Gers? You know, this year when talking to different audiences um, in my job about the trends in scripted drama, I have been using the term um, diverse perspectives on classic genres a lot, meaning that we are increasingly seeing commissions which revisit tried and tested genres and scenarios through fresh eyes, exploring familiar stories through new lenses and giving them fresh dimensions. And while it's certainly true when discussing trending drama, when thinking of what I was going to talk about on telecast this week, I caught myself at the thought that this is exactly what this whole year has been about. And not only in pretty much every genre, but allegorically in almost every aspect of our whole industry. It's been a year of finding new ways, new models of delivering what the audiences have always been expecting from us, great stories, great content, and then diving deeper into the process and looking for keys to success. One key word that springs up in my mind is hybrid. I think this year has taught us that keeping an open mind, becoming way more flexible than before and diversifying the strategies is not only a remedy for the time being, but a way going forward. And this hybrid approach now applies in different shades of to everything from making shows to organizing events and to distribution platforms. Let's take the shows, for instance. The borders between scripted and unscripted in many cases had been becoming quite blurry already pre-COVID, with the genres borrowing the best from each other. One can binge Love Island like a soap opera, while drama series are increasingly finding their grounds in true events, for instance. We are also increasingly noticing that shows are not there just for pure entertainment, but carrying some bigger purpose a bigger idea that society perhaps is finding particularly painful at this moment of time, like Black Lives Matter or gender inequality, uh, domestic violence or global environmental issues, for example. But this hybridization also expands further into new ways of creativity and also into production. Such as? Well, one example, the mix of uh, physical production and computer generating imaging used in a production of uh, movies and series during pandemics when making an effort to visualize scenes which wouldn't be possible to shoot physically due to current epidemiological restrictions. And the collaboration between funders, insurers, creators, and broadcasters form new hybrid partnership models as well. Well, uh, for example, outsourcing a post-production to a third party based on the other side of the globe. Sounds like a new international co-production hybrid without the need of crossing physical borders. And then there is this new generation of shows, particularly coming from Asia, which are bringing together real and virtual experiences. And I'm not talking about Black Mirror-like fiction, but unscripted or nearly unscripted entertainment. In February, the South Korean broadcaster NBC aired a one-off special called Meeting You, 
in which a mother was given an opportunity to meet her deceased seven-year-old daughter through VR technology. And a clip of this extraordinary show went viral via NBC's YouTube channel with over 23 million people watching the harrowing sight of a bereaved mother trying to clutch hold of the virtual reality recreation of her dead daughter, sobbing as she does so, of course. And in October, one of the world's biggest VOD platforms in terms of subscriber numbers, the Chinese IGE, launched the world's first virtual idol talent show called Dimension Nova, in which three real celebrities act as mentors, leading more than 30 virtual competitors through a series of talent competitions and challenges to select the final winner. Yes, we have seen virtual pop stars previously, but this is the first time that the show sees human mentors select and work with virtual talents. And although there uh, were perhaps a few awkward moments in the reactions between the two worlds, the digital and real world, the celeb hosts didn't try to fake it or pretend the characters are a real human. And then, among other things, a bonus of creating a virtual star is that the maintenance fee is way lower than what a real idol requires, while there is still infinitive potential for uh, spinning the IP into all sorts of merchandise and artistic transformation. Now, let's talk about the other dimensions of the industry's hybrids you briefly mentioned. Well, platforms. I think this has been the first year when we are finally acknowledging that subscriptions is not the only way forward and that the role of advertising funded online services is going to bounce back pretty soon. In US, there is even a special term subscription fatigue, describing how escalation of paid subscriptions has caused awareness among consumers whose attention span and wallet are not infinitely expandable. Various surveys suggest that more than two-thirds of Americans would accept a reasonable amount of advertising in exchange for an opportunity to watch their favorite shows for free or for a decreased subscription fee. The most often cited tolerable advertising limit stands at eight minutes per hour, in contrast to network advertising, which often reaches 18 to 20 minutes an hour. And with technologies and algorithms of ad customization constantly improving, services are experimenting with new ad formats and gamification to make ads. People are also much more likely to watch ads which resonate with their specific interests and needs. And with all this in mind, we are increasingly seeing the platforms diversifying their product, offering a range of tiers from advertising free to advertising only service. That is the example of Peacock. HBO Max is planning to introduce an ad-supported tier as well. I strongly believe that unless your brand has reached a utility status like uh, Netflix or Disney, such hybrid service combining advertising and subscription dollars is the most bulletproof business model going forward. And then, if looking further ahead, I think that this hybridization will not only continue by establishing new video partnerships and aggregators, but also by combining video services with gaming and with streaming of music into like a one-stop shop for digital entertainment. And at the beginning, you also mentioned the term hybrid in respect to events as well. Yes, exactly. While virtually first events, mostly born this year due to restrictions, will continue to provide a new way of communication and deal-making, the major long-established traditional ones, and I mean such as markets, festivals, screenings or conferences, are going to offer a mixed experience, a choice between physical, on-site and virtual, depending on the preferences and circumstances of each specific participant. And I think that the decision-making on participation is going to go far beyond just being cautious about your health and well-being. It's first and foremost about doing business in the most efficient way, right? And every case is different, of course, but I think that many have found this year eye-opening in terms of uh, using both personal and business resources as efficiently as possible. And here I don't mean just money, but for instance, time spent traveling and many other things influencing someone's productivity from fluency in using technologies to fatigue from a jet lag, for instance. So same as the viewer experience is becoming increasingly customized, the same is going to happen to participation at the industry events, I think. So 2021 is the year of the hybrid across the whole of the industry, right? Yeah, I think so. Let's look forward to it. Absolutely. Well, I think we're all going to look forward to a fresh start in 2021. 
I can't wait to have you back on the show very shortly, Gertz, to maybe talk a little bit more about what we can expect next year. Okay, agreed. Well, that's about it for another week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. So we're starting a new free weekly newsletter called Telecast Plus. We aim to make it the most useful thing coming into your inbox every Friday. It'll be packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed, jobs news, execs available for hire, Tracy's tip of the week, and more insight and opinion you can shake a stick at. And all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And there's also a link in the description to sign up as well. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in isolation in Ilkley, West Yorkshire. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.